We don't have to be wondering what the end of this whole thing is going to be because he that endures to the end will be saved. And that's what we're living for. We're, we're, we're living for, you know, I was thinking about this chapter, you know, the calling. We talked about the calling. You know, did you know that everybody in here is called? Every born again believer is called. And, the, and here's a simple thing that we're called to do. Right there in, in, in the second verse, it says that the calling is with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. You know, when everything goes right and people are talk nice to you and, and they never say anything bad about you or you don't see anybody doing anything wrong, all right, if, that's not suffering. That's long goodness. Long suffering is when it suffers, it hurts, and you long time do that for that person. Long time. Forbearing. Long time forbearing. One another in love. That's what we're called. We're called to be forbearing one to another. We're called to long time suffer with each other. In our differences, did you know that it's healthy to disagree? It is a good idea to disagree if you disagree. There, see, we, I grew up thinking that you should not disagree. You should try to always agree. And, and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't try to see the other. We should. But if you don't agree with something, you should, in lowliness, in meekness, disagree. There, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. In the pursuit of growing, learning, well, I can't see it like that because here's how I say, well, you, you see it this way, I see it this way. We do both endeavor to the calling of long-suffering in lowliness and meekness. It's not wrong to disagree. It's only wrong to bite and devour one another, destroy one another, slander one another. That's wrong. But to disagree is not wrong. Would you agree with me? It's, wrong. it's not wrong to disagree. But, but I see the word forbearing. You can't forbear somebody that is doing really good to you, that, that you're 100% like, like this. You know, that's not forbearance. It's not long-suffering if everything's 100% with each other. We are humans, and we need to allow each other to be humans. The good news is we're not following each other. And we're not going to ordain a, a preacher this morning or a deacon, a minister, a bishop, whatever you want to call it. I really don't care about the name. Um, so that he can rule over us. Jesus' own words says, the Romans and the Gentiles practice authority over you, but with you, that's us. It shall not be so. That's what he says. And so that's, and so, um, I thought that just before we, I'll make it real short, just before we go into voting here, um, let me see it. I think it's in Timothy. The second Timothy. You know, I believe most of all the men here, I don't know of anybody that isn't striving for this. We should all strive for this. I was on the roof working yesterday and I'm like thinking about this ordination and I'm thinking about we live in a time where people say, I don't need to listen to the preacher. No, you don't. I don't either. I don't have to do what he says. He's not our boss. All that is right and true. But you know what, brothers and sisters? This is where the problem is. We have people that ordain or look or vote or if people into the ministry as a joke. We have people that put people into the ministry that you can't trust. They're looking to find a following and they want to be the man. Then they do things that you can't trust. That's the, pro the problem ain't that the preachers ain't got authority over you. That's not the problem. The problem is we shouldn't vote for people that the Holy Spirit doesn't put on our heart to vote. We should, you have the opportunity now to vote for somebody that you believe wants to follow God. That you believe that would not lead people astray. Let's vote for somebody that, like this. Here's what the Bible says. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. A bishop then must be blameless. I don't know if anybody 
think about it. If you really think about it, I am blameless only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you that is, I know me. My wife knows me. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, but I still would desire to be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church? It doesn't say how shall he rule the church. There's a difference here. He says, if he doesn't, if a man know not how to rule his own house, yeah, you got to rule your house, but you don't rule the church. There's a difference. I just want to bring that out. You should control your house. Little children, when they're older, then you lead them. I think there's a difference. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, likewise, he, the same way, just like that, likewise must a deacon be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. Good thing it says much and not no wine. Right? I mean, I'm just saying, but he must be not double-tongued. Think about that. Double, a double-tongue, I tell you what, that can cause more problems than, uh, than and, and not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Now listen, we're not just looking at the men. It is important, ladies. I'm going to tell you women, if you know it or not, I don't know. You have more influence on your husband than the husbands of, we want to admit. I'm telling you, but I, I believe that wives have more influence in making your husband who he is than what you realize. If he's a jerk, you probably made him that way. Not always. Not always. But try a different method. Try a different way. I believe that, I believe women have a lot of power over their husbands, and I'm, I'm one of them. My wife has a lot of influence on me. If things, I, if, if, if she's not happy, I'm doing something wrong. It's not always the way. I know that if she's not happy, I'm doing something wrong, but most of 99% of the time she's happy because I'm doing something right. No, I'm just kidding. Verse 11, even so must the wives be. See, it's important that if you're going to vote for somebody today, look at their wives. It's not wrong. It's, it's just saying. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And I don't think sober means that they're just a sad person. But has a serious, you know, let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, a great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know that thou how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of the ground of truth. You see, the church, the body, all of us together, if we have received Jesus and believe Jesus, then we are the bride of Christ. In other words, his wife. Be careful. Be careful how you speak against his wife, because he is just like I am. You say something mean about my wife, I'll become not, not probably not quite so sober or quite so patient. Just saying, you don't speak against my wife. You shouldn't let somebody speak evil against your wife and just not care or maybe help. So that's what we want to recognize ourselves as is the children of God, the bride of Christ, the, the, his wife. And if you look at yourself like that, and you realize what you're a part of, it's a beautiful thing. It's an exciting thing. And then when we ordain somebody, we're not making the calling any different than it already is. You're just called in this congregation to lead out, to help make sure. The deacon for sure would be to take care of the money. If there's widows, to take, make sure that they're not suffering. 
If there's people in the church, we want to ordain somebody that would be good with people and is willing to um, grow in that and take care of anybody that's struggling and suffering and make sure the money is there. And if it's not there, they'll come up and say, hey, we have this bill and we need to make up more, make up more money, supposedly. I hope, I hope we don't have that problem. But that, that would be his calling is to make sure that everything financially is taken care of. Um, <clears throat> who knows? I know. Uh, I know a lot, Matthias is planning to move to Colorado, or, unless he probably gave it up now, but he, he might. He was thinking about it. <clears throat> it doesn't matter who's going to go and who's not going to go. They're eligible to be voted in, and if they go, it doesn't mean you can't go if you get voted in, right? And so, but I think, I think this is a good thing that we're doing today. We just need to, we just need to realize we're not making rulers. We're just ordaining somebody to take that place, to lead the church, and to bring them, uh, the, the, to feed the flock. <music>